This is NBA Sound System Live, featured on NBA.com sites around the world and archived on the NBA Sound System podcast feed, where you get your podcasts by searching NBA Sound System. Thank you for joining us. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, each with the handle at NBA Sound System, or visit us at NBASoundSystem.com for more. Now, NBA Sound System Live. It is indeed NBA Sound System L-I-V-E live. Carlin Gay alongside Scott Rafferty. It is Tuesday. It is 1 p.m. Eastern Time, 10 a.m. Pacific. Thanks for joining us wherever you are, however you're doing so, across the NBA Global Networks. Scott, how are you doing, sir? I'm doing better than the Spurs today, Carlin, who uh, just witnessed John Moran drop a cool 52 points on them. Uh, how, how are you doing? Can't complain, Scott. I, I really can't complain. It's it's fascinating. Sometimes you're fishing for topics to talk about on a pod, and sometimes a pod just lands right in your lap. Uh, we'll, we'll definitely talk about John Morant and the Spurs. We'll also talk about James Harden and his incredible start next to Joel Embiid, how good they've looked uh, in the early going with the Philadelphia 76ers, and then we'll decide to empty out our, our notebooks. We uh, we didn't actually discuss this prior, so I have no idea what you're going to say. I'm actually looking forward to it. And uh, if you uh, – I hope that you don't pick some of the things that I did. Honestly, we probably should have <laughs> went uh, pre-production a little behind the scenes, but we didn't have that today. But uh, I'm going to be surprised, just like the listener is, uh, by some of the things you are pointing out in the NBA. But – Everyone knows that John Morant has been incredible this season, but I think last night, we're we're talking to you on a Tuesday here, last night, Monday, uh, a ho-hum game, but it was an opportunity for Greg Popovich to tie uh, the all-time wins record as a coach, uh, tying Don Nelson. Uh, But Memphis said, and especially John Morant said, not on our watch. Um, The Grizzlies put on a great performance. John Morant put on a all-time great performance in Memphis Memphis Grizzlies history. In fact, setting the uh, franchise record for points scored. He had 52 big ones in the win over the San Antonio Spurs. And it wasn't just, Scott, that he put up you know 52 points, which is amazing in itself, but it was the highlights that he created. Um, you know, he had the, the big dunk over Jakob Perto. By the way, Jakob Perto got a block on him. Let's not forget that, right? Like Jakob Perto had a clean, clean block on him. So I want to shout out Jakob Perto for that. Um, but you know the the, the big slam over Yaga Perto, the the full court pass from Stephen Adams on the on the uh, inbound where John Morant was able to catch and sort of just you know throw it up at the rim and hit it at the buzzer going into halftime, and that was just minutes after he he, he destroyed Perto with that dunk. Um, he was incredible last night. He 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 was in one of those zones that you rarely see NBA players get into. Um, but once once it's happening, you just know that a dude's going for 50. Um, and you know, I watched the majority of that game last night. I was very impressed by not only Morant, but the entire Grizzlies team. They played great basketball, great team ball, and were able to come away with a big win at home. Um, but everyone's going to talk about Jaw. And I, my question to you now, Scott, is is he, is he a MVP favorite right now? Is Is he the MVP favorite right now? Man, it feels like we're, it is funny the news cycle that we're in right now, um, just generally, because it feels like we have the MVP conversation starting like game one of the season, and it's just a year long conversation rather than like a second half. Um, look, I, I think John Moran is without a doubt in this in this conversation, right? Like he's someone who deserves consideration. I mean, you look at what the Grizzlies have been doing the last like three months. If I, if I counted right, since December 23rd, um, when they lost to the Warriors, they're 24 and 6 since then which again if my calculations are right that's a 62 win pace like this grizzlies team is just demolishing teams playing at a high level on both ends of the court we know Ja isn't some like lockdown defender but they got good defenders around him and what he's doing to drive this offense and really like this team is just an extension of him right like they're young they're fearless we've 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 heard about the stuff that they were saying to lebron and the lakers when they played them um, they're just really tough and they're just not fun to, to play against. And I think we, like John Moran has made the, the leap to superstardom this season. He was an all-star, deservedly so. Uh, he came out of the gates hot, had that injury. Um, he's been playing at an incredibly high level. He is without a doubt in that conversation for that like four to five spot right now, I think in the MVP conversation. 
maybe I, I'm not considering taking into account enough of what he's done lately. It still feels like Embiid, Jokic, and Giannis in some order are one, two, three for me. And then you also have to take into account the stuff that DeMar DeRozan has been doing re recently. He's had a couple of rough games as of this recording back-to-back. -back. But I mean, that 35-point that 30, streak that he went on was historic. And what he's been, a been able to do to keep the Bulls at the top of the standings. And by the way, Chris Paul has also been in this conversation all season long. And I think the last couple games, what, what's happened to the Suns down the stretch of those games just kind of, you know, reinforces how valuable he is to that team. So... That was a long answer to your question. I think John Morant deserves MVP consideration. I think he's in the conversation. I don't quite know if he can win it, even despite how these next 15, 20 games go. Um, but the fact that, what, he's in his third year, the leap that he's already made this season, and the fact that we are speaking about him as an MVP candidate, I mean, it speaks volumes of kind of the development and what he's been able to do. Yeah, it's been special. Um, I will say that I do think, you know, uh, he has an opportunity to win this thing. Um, there's a lot of basketball left to be played. And the race is so wide open that, you know, I, I think voters will, will probably live in the moment and might vote for someone based on how they close this regular season. And it's going to be so important for our teams to close strong. Um, you know, we know how things are jumbled up in the East, um, and I'm sure we'll get to that a little later on. But out West, the Memphis Grizzlies have a real shot of finishing second in the Western Conference. Um, I don't think that they can catch the Phoenix Suns. The gap right now is seven games. I doubt Phoenix really collapses, even without Chris Paul, where the Grizzlies might be able to grab the number one seed. But if the Memphis Grizzlies finish second in the Western Conference, um, after a year ago having to claw through the playing tournament just to get into the postseason and and losing in the fashion that they did, I think they got gentlemen, gentlemen sweep by the, the, the Utah Jazz in that series, if not swept. Uh, I don't think anyone would have predicted that the Memphis Grizzlies would finish second in the Western Conference. And I don't want to fall into the to the category of, well, we just give John Morant most improved player. Because I think that's easy to do. And I hate the discussion of giving a player that was second overall the most improved player award. Um, you know, I, you know, you know how I feel about that, Scott. The, the, the dude I was do. drafted second overall. He was supposed to be good. So I, I, I and I, I, I think those people – uh, that want to put him in that discussion, they're cowards. Because at the end of the day, if you're going to give him the most improved player, you're, you're taking away, you're, you're basically saying that you don't think he's good enough to, or he, he hasn't spent enough time uh, atop the NBA to win the MVP. Um, so you're just kind of giving him this consolation prize as most improved. And for those voters, stop being cowards. If, if you think that John Morant is, is truly in the conversation for the MVP, then vote for him. Um, and, and I think, you know, there's still plenty of time. Like I said, there's still close to 20 games left in the regular season. If they pass the Warriors, if they continue to play the way they've been playing, they have a great away from home record of 22 and 10 on the road for a young team. They actually have a right now uh, because they've played one more road game. They have an identical road and home game. So you, you really don't get that that drop off. They're missing Dylan Brooks. Uh, who's their second leading scorer on the team? That's 18 points per game that they're not getting from him. And by the way, uh, um, you know their their go-to defender on a nightly basis. Um, that you know that's that's taking on the challenge of guarding the other team's best player. For all accounts and purposes, from everyone I talk to around the the Grizzlies, Dylan Brooks is like their heart and soul. Like that's that, that's the, that's their guy, right? That's that's the guy that, that that has really moved the needle for them in terms of just giving them that edge and that toughness. And John Morant has taken all of that. Um, you know, without Dylan Brooks in the lineup, he seems to be, you know, sometimes the best player isn't the bully uh, on the team. He normally has muscle to go up, you know, to, to go to bat for him. John Morant's that muscle. You know, Scott, you, you posted in our work Slack that John Morant's now leading the league in points in the paint. And there was questions By about whether or not. Too. Right. And there was questions about whether or not he was too small or too slender you know, to take hits in the NBA. And there's a dude that's getting to the paint at will and constantly coming back. I feel like every time I watch a Grizzlies game, there's like a there's a moment in time where I'm holding my breath because Morant gets hit and falls to the ground and you're like, oh my God, this this could be the one. And he just bounces right back up like if it's a trampoline. And, and he's at the foul line taking his free throws. And guess what? He's not afraid to go back in there again. Uh, you know, I, I am enamored with, you know, the way that this dude has... Uh, you know, figured out the league. He's he's playing like he knows he's really good. And I know that's, that's a weird thing to say, but sometimes there's a lot of players that just play well 
and don't realize how good they are. I think Zion falls under that category. Like Zion's Zion's a great basketball player. But I still think I still feel like he's he's almost you know um, embarrassed by how good he is. But John Morant has a swagger to him. No, that he knows that he belongs. Um, that he's not you know he's not just an all star by you know. You know, people just keep handing it to him. He, he went out and worked for it. He took it. And now I think he believes that he could really be the league MVP. And that's a scary proposition for the rest of the league. It is. And I, look, I, I think there's, there's another conversation to be had here because I don't think it's just most improved and most valuable for him. Like, all NBA is a huge honor and he is in consideration. I haven't sat down and like put all the names down. He's 100% in consideration for an All-NBA First Team selection, right? It's like, off the top of my head, him, Steph, um, Luca, like, those are the guys he can beat him with that spot. And he, at the rate he's going, he's probably going to get that. And you think a guy three years removed from being drafted, making an All-NBA First Team with the talent that's in the league right now, um, that would be an incredible accomplishment as well. So I, I just don't want to, I don't think it's necessarily like he's either most improved or getting most valuable player votes. If he makes All-NBA First Team, that's a hell of an accomplishment as well. Um I, look, it's well, we don't have to turn this into a conversation about the MVP candidates. I, I still think, you know, you look at what Jokic is doing. You look at the on-off numbers, the impact that he's having on that team without their two best players. He gets a triple-double, what it seems like, on a nightly basis. He has a game against the Blazers the other night where he scores like eight points because he's not even looking to score. But he still gets like double-digit assists and has one of the best passes I've, I've seen in a long time. Um, and Bead has been utterly dominant. Um, basically since that that tough stretch at the start of the season and him in the Philadelphia 76ers are going to take off here. And look, Giannis. Giannis is probably the most dominant two-way player in the league today. Um, and even though the Bucks haven't been quite as dominant as years past, they're still one of the best teams in the league. I think you and I both consider them, um, if not the favorites, one of the favorites to win the championship this season. Like, the MVP field is just is just crazy. And I don't think it's disrespectful to, to Ja to say that he's not, like, hands down, you know, like the MVP. Like, there's just so many people in this race. And he absolutely deserves consideration. I'm not saying that he doesn't. Um, it's just... The, the, and to your point, like... What happens in these next 15, 20 games could go a long way in determining that, right? Like, it felt like the first 50-odd games last year was when the the MVP race was was really difficult to, to kind of, you know, figure out because it was LeBron first and it was Embiid and Jokic. And then Embiid got hurt and Jokic really, like, took off the last 20 games. And it was, it was basically a done deal by the end. Right. Whereas this year, it's felt tight and it does feel like nothing's really set in stone um, and something could happen over these next 50 or 20 games to sway voters in a number of directions. Like we could, we could be seeing first place votes for, for Jokic and Bede, maybe DeRozan, maybe Morant. Um, I, it, this feels like it's going to be one of the, the closer MVP races we've had in a long time. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And, and, and you didn't even mention DeMar DeRozan or, or Luka Doncic who could garner some first place votes uh, as well. I, 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 I was talking to uh, a you know friend of the show Chase Thomas um, the other day about uh, you know the Chris Paul injury and how it might even affect Devin Booker's MVP candidacy because it felt like they were going to split votes had they been healthy the rest of the way and that would have eliminated both of them out of the com- you know conversation. I think m- most people had Chris Paul had a little bit, but I do feel like there was enough um, there to make an argument that Devin Booker is just equally as important to that team as Chris Paul is. And now with Paul out, I felt like you know Booker was you know maybe going to be able to maybe put some stock you know to, to you know accelerate his MVP candidacy there uh, with Paul being out pretty much the rest of the season here. And, you know, it, it, as you said, the, the field is just going to be tough, uh, even for that all NBA spot. Uh, there's only two guard spots and, and you know, mm-hmm. they, we named, you know, seven guards that uh, are, are very much capable of, of holding down those two spots. So um, I don't know. I, 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 like I said, I'm, I'm, I understand that the race is, is 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 right now a two horse race with Embiid and Jokic in most people's minds. I do want to say before you guys you know make your decisions, you know let the rest of the month and a half in the NBA regular season play out because it is it is very close and a lot can happen between now and then when uh, when votes have to be in. So um, you know all that to say, John Morant's been incredible. I, most people will be able to see him on national TV. If you haven't seen it, first of all, if you don't have Lee Pass, go ahead and get it. I think it's at a discount right now, so that helps. Uh, but for those of you who don't um, and haven't seen the Grizzlies play a ton, they'll, they'll play the Boston Celtics on, on TNT on Thursday. They head to Boston, and that will be a, a fun game. I think the Boston crowd will be fired up. 
I think John Morant will be fired up in front of a national audience. Uh, so it should it should be good. All right, let's uh, let's move on to the other team that's getting a lot of headlines, Scott. Uh, we have the Philadelphia 76ers, who the new look Philadelphia 76ers with James Harden. So um, he made his debut over the weekend and looked like we expected him to look like, like the former MVP of, of the league. Like he looked really good. So did Embiid. The Sixers, um, you know, obviously blew out the Timberwolves in, in on Friday night and then um, you know, ran away from the Knicks late. I think that game, the score didn't show how close that game was for the majority of it, but they, they ran away from the Knicks late on Sunday. They'll play the Knicks again in a home and away, uh, I believe, on Wednesday. So we'll, we'll get a good taste of the Sixers going forward uh, because they have a ton of games on national TV, and they have a pretty much a murderer's row coming up for them uh, on the schedule where they play the Heat, the Bulls, and the Nets that could feature KD and Kyrie next Thursday. Uh, but, you know, two games in, what, what's your initial thoughts on the combination of Harden and Embiid? I mean, they they look incredible. I, I, there's no other way to put it. Look, I... It's a, we're talking about two games here against two teams. The, the Timberwolves have been good this season, but the Knicks have not. Um, so take this as you will. But Philly with Harden and Embiid on the court are scoring at a rate of 134.5 points per 100 possessions uh, right now. And I don't. I, I think it's safe to assume that they're not going to sustain that because that's like the greatest offense ever by like an absolute mile. But it does point to the fact that they've been utterly dominant the first two games together. And I think for me... The question about this pairing wasn't whether or not they they were going to be a dominant duo. Like you, just on a very simple level, we're talking about two of the best scorers in the NBA, two dominant forces, Joel Embiid in the post, the stuff that James Harden does in isolation and his passing. Like it was very easy to see this being a dominant duo. But the biggest question for me was whether or not they would be able to to kind of coexist together and get the most out of each other because their right. games on paper don't necessarily match. Like, they're not like a perfect match together. Right. And I think the most encouraging thing from the first two games is just the the chemistry that they already have in pick and rolls, especially with Embiid rolling to the basket, which isn't something that we've seen him do really all that much over the last few seasons. Like, I, I looked up the stats um, after their first game together, and Embiid was basically five times more likely to pick and pop than he was to pick and roll. And he's not like a Clint Capella. Um, the, the, these like rim running centers who play above the rim that Harden has kind of thrived with in the past. But Embiid, I mean, he's just, I mean, he's, he's just massive, right? He, he's so well coordinated. He has great hands, um, great touch around the basket. So even him just rolling to the basket, even if he's not catching lobs and throwing it down, he can go get it. And then he's just like impossible to stop when he gets the, the ball anywhere within like six feet of the rim. Um, and really, like you look at it from those two games, it's like in a drop coverage, Harden can go to that floater, which he's kind of struggled with this season, but it has become a weapon for him over the last few seasons. If you switch, I mean, I just said it, like we're talking about two of the best one-on-one -on -one scorers in the league. Like Embiid is going to pick anyone apart who isn't a center. I mean, he, he makes most centers look foolish down the post, but you switch like a forward onto him, they have no chance. And James Harden is the most dominant isolation scorer, um, certainly of, of the last five, 10 years, potentially ever, um, when you just look at the numbers. Like they can go pick a mismatch apart no matter what. And then as we saw in that Timberwolves game, if they put two on the ball and Embiid just slips to the basket, you have like Carl Anthony Towns guarding the perimeter. That means Joel Embiid is rolling to the basket with like D'Angelo Russell being the last line of defense. And I don't think I need to tell anyone that that's just not going to end well for the Timberwolves or any other team who have their six foot four inch point guard trying to protect the rim against Joel Embiid. Um, they, they just, they, they, they look like they're playing really well off of each other. It looks natural. Tyrese Maxey has had a couple big games as well. Like he looks kind of like the third scorer next to them who can really play off of them well. Um, I mean, they, they, they just look so good offensively. And, and by the way, they're going to live at the foul line. Like we knew that, but Joel B taking what, 20 plus free throws against the Knicks and just getting that time and time again. Um, James Harden taking 10 in that game as well offensively they're just going to be monsters um and really look the question for this team is going to be in the playoffs because we, we you know james how we've talked about this before james harden has fallen short in the playoffs in the past he's had some some not great moments um joel Embiid, I, I think some of the playoff stuff has been overblown with him um but there's also no denying that he he hasn't been quite as dominant in the playoffs than he has in the regular season at least a few times um so that's going to be the real test for this team but i think ultimately like i i don't think this could have gotten off to a better start to be quite frank yeah, and 
Honestly, Scott, I, I, when I looked at these two games, um, I said to myself that, you know, I think we forget how how much of a fit it used to be in the league to have a great big man and a great guard. Um, you know, over the last couple of years, we've seen wings dominate. We've seen positionless basketball work at a high level. Uh, but when you look at the history of the league and some of the champions that we've had, um, you know, going back to, you know, uh, Kobe and, and, and Powell, uh, you know, Tony Parker and, 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 and Tim Duncan, uh, even Chauncey Billups and, and, and Rasheed Wallace. Like that team really took off when Rasheed Wallace shows up in, in, in Detroit uh, to pair with Chauncey Billups. Uh, go back even further. Akeem and Elijah Wan and, and, and Clyde Drexler. And if you go back even further, you have the Magic and Kareem. And, um, you know, even further than that, uh, you know, you, you, could, you could go back to Kareem and uh, Oscar Robinson. Um, and even teams that just had had success. Um, in a short period of time with a guard and a big when they got put together. Penny and Shaq did it early in their career. The second year Penny was in the league, they're in the finals. Um, you know, you go back to when Shaq got traded to Miami, him and D-Wade go to the finals in their second year together and win the championship. Like, it sometimes it just fits better to have a big and a guard uh, because I think both of them like the spacing that both can create and we're starting to see that with Harden and Embiid um I think where so I I have no question about their fit but I think where Philly's going to have to figure things out and of course they've looked great together but where Philly's going to have to really figure things out is the others because everything now changes around um you know the team like where they get their shots if when to take those shots um, you know, Tyrus Maxey has looked great in the first two games, right? Like it feels like he's playing freer. He's getting to be able to attack downhill with a lot more space. He's so quick so that, you know, when you get him on a, a, a scramble defense, he's going to be able to get to the 10. And he, it looks like he's just enjoying himself out there. Mm-hmm. Tobias Harris, not so much. And, you know, I, I listen to other podcasts where there's already, you know, trade scenarios for him in the offseason and everything else. <laughs> but he has the ability to really be that third consistent scorer. But it's going to take him time to figure out what that actually looks like. Does that look like, uh, you know, does that come for him when he's on the floor with Harden and Embiid? Does that come for him when he's on the floor with one of the two of them? You know, how does he attack? How does he figure things out? And he, he's he's definitely struggled in the last two games to, to find that out. Um, and I, I think he, for me, Philly's championship uh, hopes don't I don't want to put them all on Tobias Harris, but they they do rely on what the other players can bring to the table because I have no question that Harden and Beat are going to be able to put up you know sixty points at least between the two of them, but where do those other points come from? Can Tyrese Maxey keep this up? Um, and 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 on the games where he where he can't, can Danny Green make enough shots for it to matter? Can uh, you know Thibel find a, sh- a shooting stroke in, in you know key scenarios which we don't expect him to all the time? But definitely, can Tobias Harris be consistent enough to give you at least fifteen to eighteen points a game? Uh, I think that's where the championship hopes are going to lie for me. And over the next month and a half, that's really what I want to see. I want him to see Tobias Harris specifically become comfortable being the third option, sometimes fourth, and finding his way offensively. It's a really good point. And, and we've seen this time and time again over the last few years, right? And not, not to compare him to these players because he's never been an all-star. Tobias Harris is a very good player, by the way. Um, but he, he's not like the level of a Chris Bosch. But when we saw him go to Miami, like he's the one who had to make the adjustments and find his role, right? Um, even this season, a guy like Nikola Vucevic, a two-time All-Star, a guy who was coming off the most dominant season of his career and a guy who had the offense run through him all of the time, having to find a new role for himself in Chicago next to DeMar DeRozan and Zach Levine, figure out the way that he can make an impact. Um, it's really difficult. And I, I think that's a really good point about Tobias Harris because it does feel like I mean, James Harden's going to dominate the ball. We know that. Joel Embiid is going to get a ton of shots. We know that. Tyrese Maxey is, is just a natural fit next to them, a guy who can hit shots, make quick decisions, like you said, get out in transition, um, and how Tobias Harris fits into that, where he can get his shots. Because um, really, I mean, he, he was like the secondary offensive option uh, for them, right? Even when Ben Simmons was playing, because Ben Simmons was limited in the half court. So it was a lot of, a lot of Tobias Harris um, in addition to Joel Embiid and like Seth Curry handoffs and stuff like that. So um, I, I do think that's a really good point. I also have questions about who that fifth player is going to be because I think, um, you know, it is going to be James Harden, Tyrese Maxey, Joel Embiid and Tobias Harris, I think, closing games. Mm-hmm. And really that that fifth spot is, is kind of up for grabs because Matisse Tybel, we know what he's capable of defensively. As you said, can he give them an offer offensively? How much does he hurt their spacing if he's not, not knocking down shots? 
Danny Green's long been one of the best role players in the league, a guy who's won multiple championships on, on different teams, but he's, he's not quite that same player anymore. And then after then, you're getting to like Furkan uh, Korkmaz, who can, you know, we know he can shoot the ball, but he's gonna, is he going to be relied on in heavy minutes in big games? Georges Niang, Paul Millsap, Shake Milton. Um, that fifth spot, I do feel like, is going to be very interesting to see kind of who grabs that. Yeah, I, I actually, you know, Georges Niang, people might laugh. He might be the the, the sure bet there, um, you know, just because he's he's not going to – he knows that he's not going to get the bulk of the shots and he's going to be okay with mm-hmm. that and his defense is good enough to get you by. Um, you know, I, I looked at Tobias Harris's shooting numbers the last two games with Harden now in the lineup. He went two for nine on Friday uh, for six points and he went three for nine on Sunday for 12 points. He did get to the line a little bit, which is, you know – um, everyone got to the line in that game uh, on both sides. There was a lot of fouls in that game against the Knicks. But what bothered me about Tobias Harris uh, is, you know, he, he he took six of his nine shots on Friday came from three point range. Uh, two of his nine, or sorry, five of his nine shots came from three point range on on Sunday. And for me, I'm okay if he's he's going to be able to. He obviously, we'll get a lot more open three pointers with Harden and Embiid on the floor because he's just going to have more space naturally. But for me, I think. You know, the Tobias Harris that, you know, was playing at a borderline all-star level, um, you know, in his time in Detroit and, and a little bit of his time in Orlando and even with the Clippers a little bit, um, it, he wasn't just a three-point, you know, corner shooter. Like, he was a guy that would be able to at least put the ball in the deck and get to the rim a little bit. And I think he has the opportunity now with the spacing to catch defenses and scramble and, and maybe put it on the deck for a one-dribble pull-up in the mid-range. Um, that would you know get him in rhythm and you know the catch and shoot is 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 nice if you can if you can knock it down uh, but I just don't think that's his game and I think he needs to get back to playing his game uh, which is you know maybe a one dribble two dribble pull up uh, situation for him uh, when he when he's on a scramble so it, I, I I just want to see Tobias Harris be Tobias Harris like don't be shy about you know being the third guy um, you know sometimes it's not gonna it's not going to fall for you, but you know he shouldn't be just taking nine shots, you know, in in, in an NBA mm-hmm. game with the amount of possessions that we have. Like he's averaging four fifteen on the season, and for his career, you know, he, he's he's just above that, right? So nine shots is not enough, um, you know, for for a third player uh, and a guy you expect to score consistently uh, in the NBA. Yeah, and I, but again, I think the the biggest thing going into this kind of after this trade was how long it was going to take James Harden and Joel Embiid to, to get on the same page. They've done it right off the bat. They look incredible. Um, I do have faith in Tobias Harris being able to figure it out, and they still have like 20-odd games before the playoffs um, to do that. I'm so worried. I, I'm, sorry? I'm worried. I, re- I really, really am. I'm worried. Yeah, I'm worried about Tobias Harris. I'm not worried about Joel Embiid and, and James Harden. And like you said, uh, you know, both offensive geniuses, both just basketball geniuses in general, mm-hmm. but and also the big men, um, you know, guard fit normally works. I'm worried about Tobias Harris because, as you said, you know, you brought up Chris Bosh, rightfully so. You brought up, um, you know, other stars that have, uh, you know, had to make that sacrifice and become that third wheel. And it's it's not always the easiest thing to do because you're just not imp- like Tobias Harris is not a lockdown defender. Right. So he and he's not he's not a, a, a big time playmaker. So right. if you're taking away his scoring, it's like, what do you what is he doing to impact the game? He almost feels like he's just kind of out there. And at that point, you know, why not get? Bible in there instead. Why not put in Niang instead if you're if you're going to be able to stretch the floor if it's you know Harris's jump shots not falling. So it is such a tough situation for him to be in, and I just don't feel like you know the 20 games that they have left uh, around that mark anyway. I'm not I'm not sure if if it's exactly 20, but around that mark is going to be enough for him to be comfortable in the third role. I think this feels like it has to go through another training camp. It feels like it has to go through an off season and everything else for him to be comfortable. Can they win without him? Maybe. Um, can someone else step up? Maybe, but I I do think that they are their ceiling uh, is higher when Tobias Harris is comfortable in the third man role. Yeah, I mean I I agree with that, and maybe it's one of those things we've seen a lot of um, Harden and Embiid. They've basically been on on the floor the entire time. One of them, right? Um, Doc Rivers has been splitting them up a little bit. So Tobias Harris is going to get run with just one of them on the court. I would sure. think quite a bit over these next twenty games. Maybe that's that gets them going a little bit. Um, but no, I mean, it's a good point. I, I hadn't really thought of it because um, I think like many, my attention was uh, mainly on James Harden and Joel Embiid pick and rolling teams to an oblivion um, of the last few games and Tyrese Maxey going off. But no, that's 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 a good point about Tobias Harris. They, they definitely do need him. Um, 
even if you just take away the the financial part of it, the amount of money that he's making, the amount of money they've committed to him on this team, um, you know, he, he's been a big part of the success over the last couple of years. And for them to be yeah. able to reach that ceiling, they're going to need him to be involved. It could work. I'm not. I'm not counting it out. But uh, I do. I do worry about the time that they have left. Uh, all right. Let's let's get to our notebook uh, segment. We're gonna both take two uh, two things that we've uh, paid attention to over the last little bit here and and bring it to light. So you could go ahead and start first. Uh, what's one of the things that uh, has stuck out to you over the last, last little bit here? It is funny. We, we you know we talked about Moran at the start of this, DeRozan, um, Embiid, all these big players, big teams. The Miami Heat feels like everyone is sleeping on them. No one's paying attention to them. They're forty-one and twenty-one, best record in the Eastern Conference by two mm-hmm. games over the Bulls. Um, they just basically haven't been healthy the entire season. It feels like every key player for them has missed an extended amount of time, but they're finally getting healthy. Um, they've been able to pick up the, these wins despite that. And like, I mean, they're, they're, they're core cool defensively. That Bam Adebayo, Jimmy Butler, P.J. Tucker, Kyle Lowry, I mean, that's just a nightmare defensively. Like the way they fly around the court, um, the way they move on a string together. Bam Adebayo in particular, he's had some absolutely absurd defensive stops over yes. the last couple games. He had one against the Hornets. Um I feel like he like switched three different times onto three different players and like blocked a shot at the basket. He had another one against the Bulls the other night where he switched on to to uh, Kobe White and then like switched back onto Vucevic to break it an alley oop. Like the defensive player of the year, I think has has been a very interesting race to this point because it really was like the first forty games. It felt like a foregone conclusion that it was going to be Draymond Green or Rudy Gobert, and it might still, by the way, like Gobert might win this. Um, Green, I think the amount of time that he's missed. It's probably more unlikely. But Bam Adebayo, I think he's going to end up playing probably a similar amount of games as Gobert. And it doesn't feel like he's getting kind of DPOY attention, but I think he deserves mm. it. Like, he, he's yeah. just he's just unbelievable. And I don't need to tell you that. I know you, you're as a big a fan of Adebayo as anyone. But, uh, yeah, he, he's some of the stuff that he does on a nightly basis on the end of the court is, is pretty mind-blowing. Yeah, the Heat are on a four-game winning streak. Listen to their next three. On the road at Milwaukee, on the road at Brooklyn, and they host the Philadelphia 76ers. That's three games in four nights, so we'll find out exactly how good that team can be. Um, I'm going to the other conference, and I want to pay attention to the Utah Jazz because they they won uh, a huge game on, on the weekend, uh, coming back in grand fashion, beating the, um, I don't know, Chris Paulus, uh, you know, Phoenix Suns, but I think that was a huge win for them in terms of a couple things, Scott. One, it was a big comeback in a big spot. It felt like a playoff game. That's Last Sunday felt like uh, the old 90s days for me, um, watching the NBA on NBC. I, I know the games are on ABC now, but it really felt like that. You had the, you had the Eastern Conference game uh, you know, early and then the Western Conference game late. Um, relatively late. It wasn't that late. It was 3 p.m. The game started. So, um, but that felt like the old days for me, and it, it also felt like the players realized that you know the nation was watching. Um, you know, Donovan Mitchell was Mike, M- M- Donovan Mitchell was mic'd up talking to, to referees, saying, "Hey, you got to let a little bit more contact go. This is a playoff basketball." Um, and you know, they, they showed up, and it was a big comeback for the Jazz, and the way they did it. Uh, was special. You know, they they got they got back to um, you know early in the game. They were getting killed with draw coverage. They decided to you know switch out of that and have Gobert and Whiteside you know switch off onto guards and, and guard on the perimeter a little bit. Now, granted, you don't want those guys in the deep end of the pool too often, um, but they they can they can hold their own in a couple of possessions per game. And they were able to you know reduce the lead and chip away. And when they're making three, Scott, the Utah Jazz are going to be a tough team to beat. Um, you know, I think I, like everyone else, still have questions about them. I get that. But I do feel like this is probably the best version of the team that they expect to, you know, make the deep run in the playoffs. They have the most versatility, I think, uh, right now. Even with the Ingles injury, I think that they're going to be – and he's no longer on the team, obviously. But even even without – Joe Ingles in the mix. I think they have enough there uh, that, that will actually shorten their rotation. They'll go to their eight players, and they know who to to, to bring in. And I think Jordan Clarkson is enough of an X factor that he can get hot for a series and and maybe steal a game or two on the road that you probably shouldn't win. Um, you know when when shots aren't falling. So I, I think there's enough there. If Whiteside's focus, which isn't always the case, um, you know he he, he is a, he is also a tough uh, you know replacement to have come off the bench when when Rudy Gobert is is. You know, um, you know, resting in game. So, uh, I, I do like the Jazz a lot. Um, 
I, I have the same questions as everyone, but I, I think we should start paying attention to them and taking them seriously a little bit. Yeah, it's funny. We I feel like we was it last week we talked about them and uh, they were in a little bit of a weird stretch going into All Star. And I said like something doesn't feel quite right about them, even though like I was still somewhat optimistic. Um, even you know despite the same questions that you have, and they picked up two really good wins. Um, you know that Dallas game was super impressive as well. What they were able to do down the stretch, specifically Rudy Gobert switching on to Luka Doncic several times. And, I mean, Luka couldn't get anything against him. Um, that yeah. was super impressive. That was a great win. And as you said, that Suns one was a good one for them as well. I, I think generally, by the way, I, I do feel like Donovan Mitchell's season's getting slept on a little bit. Like, it, it mm. felt like... It felt like the Jazz were so good last year when they were number one seed. And everyone was kind of just like, the Jazz are so good. Like, Donovan Mitchell, should he be All-NBA consideration, all that? And then they fall short in the playoffs. Um, it's been a little bit of a weird season. But, I mean, he's his his numbers are basically the same, um, scoring-wise, passing-wise. He's shooting the best he ever has from the field. Um, it feels like he just makes big plays for them whenever they need him to. I, I, I feel like we're, we're not, not, not enough is being made. Um, of the season that he's have uh, he's having, and I also feel like he has he like he, he takes like a little leap every single season, right? It feels like there is something little things like on the margins that he gets better at that just makes him an even better player. Um, I, I've never I, I wouldn't say I've ever been like a big Donovan Mitchell guy, um, but I find the more that I watch him, um, the more that he grows. I do feel like I grow even more appreciation for his game. Yeah, he's played really well. Um, I'm going to keep us moving here and talk about this other team real quickly. It's still in the Western Conference. I, I'm I'm watching more Timberwolves games. I'm finding myself watching them a little mm. bit more. I think they're a year away from from being what Memphis is this year. Um, it, but I I do believe that they have a swagger to them. You know, Cat's playing incredible. He was an All Star this year. Um, you know, Anthony Edwards is actually becoming a really good two way player. I, I don't think people realize how good he is defensively when he is locked in. Um, you know, D'Angelo Russell has has kind of slotted in as that third guy, the playmaker, being happy to give up and and make those open shots when they do become available. Um, they're a good team, and they have young play, good young players. They're going to make the play, the at least the play in this year. I think that experience is going to be good for them. And I do believe that that Patrick Beverly trade. Sometimes you have one of those trades that bring in a veteran yeah. voice that just changes things. Patrick Beverly trade kind of allowed them to be uh, more focused. Um, you know, on, on, a, on, a, on a nightly basis. I, I feel like there is there is more intention with, with games that they, you know, you, you rarely see them get, um, you know, crushed because they're just not bringing it that night. It's it's either the team's just flat out better with them than them, the, a la the Sixers the other night, um, or, or they're missing shots or whatever the case may be. But in terms of just a level of effort, I think Patrick Beverly has raised that for them across the board. And, and he's definitely going to help in that playing game. Uh, to to make them realize a sense of urgency that they need to have possession on possession. And Chris Finch is actually a really good coach, man. Like I, he's mm-hmm. one of the guys that just I don't think people you know he, he probably walked down the street in Minnesota and no one's stopping him. But he he is finding ways. If you if you go back and look at tape, he's finding ways to get Anthony Edwards in positions to score that I don't think you know that makes his life a lot easier. Same with with Cat. Uh, especially out of timeouts, like I think we need to start appreciating just the the intelligence we have uh, in in the coaching ranks uh, across the board. There's a lot of coaches that are coming up with some pretty cool things uh, to get guys yeah. shots, um, and and we kind of just look at these games and say, oh, okay, cool. <laughs> so uh, yeah, the, the Timberwolves just keep an eye on them. I, I wouldn't be shocked uh, if they actually make the playoffs proper and and maybe steal a game from uh, whoever it is that they play in the first round. They've been fun. They've, they've, they've had some uh, really good games lately that have been decided in crunch time. D'Angelo Russell went absolutely nuts the other day, scoring like 20-plus points in the fourth quarter. Um, and then Cat hit, hit a game winner the other night. Um, I, I do think the interesting thing about them, too, is like uh, D'Angelo Russell's a fantastic passer, um, an underrated passer, I do feel like. But it is interesting that their three best players are kind of, you know, score-first mentality. And yet they seem to play well off of each other, enjoy playing with each other. And I think yeah. some of that is, you know, Cat is is really unselfish, actually. Um, Anthony Edwards, I mean, he just seems like an absolute joy to be around, play with. Uh, he plays with a ton of confidence. Like, they, they, they seem to have figured that out, um, which is interesting. And, th- yeah, they've been a fun team, um, better than I think anyone expected coming into the season. So it, it's going to be interesting. Um, for me, my last one, by the way, look, the Thunder don't get a lot of national attention. Um, sure. they're, they're losing a ton of games. But I, 
I feel like there were conversations over the last few weeks in our Slack channel about whether or not um, we'd want Josh Giddy or Shea Gilders Alexander for the next five years if we had shoes. Sure. There was a little bit too much uh, Giddy noise for, for my liking. <laughs> and since Shea has come back, I mean, he had 32 points in his first game back from injury, 36, and then he had 37, 10, and 7, and albeit a 21 point loss against the Kings. Um, but that's three straight 30 point games. I think it's easy to forget because he did that, miss that much time just how incredible of a scorer he is. Like, he's mm. just so effortless on the end of the court. Um, I, I'm a big Shea guy, have been since day one, and um, just wanted to give him a little bit of love because, again, OKC doesn't get a ton of attention. 35 points per game, 6.7 assists, 6 rebounds, basically uh, shooting 61% from the field and 39% from three. And by the way, he's getting to the foul line, 10 a game. Like, that, he's getting a, he's getting the generous whistle over his last three. Um, yeah, as you said, you know, most people aren't watching the Thunder. By the way, let's let's also be fair in this and saying that, one, he's averaging six turnovers per game, but with the talent that he has around him, you, you just kind of mm-hmm. take that. And then secondly, they got blown out twice. They, they lost by 20 in two of those, those three games. They did. Um, so, um, you know, we, we, can't, we can't go overboard in saying that, you know, he, he's been – but he has been incredible. He, he really has um, all season long. And – once he gets some more talent around him, you know, Giddy's one piece, but they'll they'll add. They have you know twenty thousand draft picks over the next seven drafts, so they'll they'll add more talent, top end talent as the the lottery balls fall their way. So, um, you know, it's exciting. Um, but let's get out of here. We have uh, um, a lot to get to this week, basketball wise. There's some great national TV matchups coming up. Uh, but I do encourage everyone to circle that Memphis Grizzlies game against the Boston Celtics on TNT. Uh, we'll be back next week to break it all down uh, as we close in. At the uh, the end, season's coming. Season end is coming. Maybe maybe in the next couple of weeks or so, we'll, we'll, we'll get into some draft talk as well because I know March Madness is coming up and a lot of you guys uh, out there listening will, will probably be paying attention a little bit to, to college basketball if you haven't all year to see who the next NBA gem is. So we'll, we'll probably enlist our, our guy Kyle Irving to, to hop on with us and, and chat some some college ball. It's always fun when you have, we have him on the program. Um, but for Scott Rafty, I'm Carlton Gay. If you haven't yet, please subscribe to NBA Sound System, wherever you find your podcast, rate and review, does us a ton of help. We'll see you next week, 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific, across the NBA Global Networks. This has been NBA Sound System. Mm-hmm.